In this lecture, I'm going to discuss kernel architectures. I'll begin by introducing the functions of the kernel, explain the separation between mechanism and policy, talk about some seminal early kernels in the history of computing, and then introduce the differences between monolithic kernels and microkernels. A kernel provides two functions, the same two functions as any operating system. It provides abstraction and arbitration. The kernel provides abstraction in the sense that it provides a mechanism for programs to access hardware, a way to schedule multi -pro multiple programs on the system, and it provides some method for interprocess communication, or IPC, a way for programs to send messages to each other or send messages to hardware devices or out to the network. Kernels also provide abstraction mechanisms. They ensure that a single process or running program can't take over the entire system. They enforce any kind of security requirements such as access privileges that might be in place on the system and they minimize the risk of a total system crash from a buggy application or device driver. It's important to distinguish between mechanism and policy when discussing the internal components of an operating system. The mechanism, put simply, is the software methods that enable operations to be carried out. An example of a mechanism would be code that, implemented inside a device driver, sends a message to a device that causes that device to blink a light, enable a camera, or perform some other hardware level operation. Policy, on the other hand, is a set of software methods that enforce permissions, access rules, or other limits against applications. So a policy, for example, would be something that said that only users who met certain criteria could send a message out to a hardware device to blink a light or enable a camera or perform some other hardware function. It's a generally accepted principle of good design that mechanism and policy should be separated as much as possible. An early kernel that separated mechanism and policy quite well was the Regnacentralen RC4000 monitor kernel. This kernel was developed in 1969 primarily by Per Brink Hansen for the Regnacentralen RC4000 computer system. This was a computer system that was developed in Denmark. And the central component of the system was a small nucleus, as Brink Hansen called it, called monitor, which allowed programs to send messages to each other and allowed programs to send and receive buffers, which were essentially types of messages for hardware, to and from different hardware devices. In particular, at that time, they had a card reader or a tape reader and a printing style output device. Other kernels with different scheduling mechanisms and other capabilities could be run under monitor. In those days, it was not clear that multi-programming was really a desirable feature for computing. Thus, someone could write a multi-programming capable kernel and actually run that as a subkernel under the monitor system. Importantly, this was also the first system that allowed subkernels and systems level software to be written in a high level language, in this case, Pascal. The system performance was actually quite awful. Brink Hansen stated that the operating system itself was so slow at performing its IPC tasks that there were a number of issues with the system uh, completing tasks on time. However, the system was stable and reliable, making it successful in computer science history, even if it was not a successful product commercially. On the other hand, the opposite extreme would be the Unix kernel. This was developed at Bell Labs by a team headed by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, also starting in the late 1960s. The difference between the Unix kernel and the RC4000 monitor was that the Unix kernel's design implemented performance. Thus, instead of having a very small kernel that simply provided an IPC mechanism and some basic resource collision avoidance, this kernel actually provided all the device drivers, all the scheduling, all the memory management, including support for multi-programming, directly inside the kernel.
This kernel was an early example of what would later be called a monolithic kernel. A monolithic kernel is a kernel that contains the entire operating system in kernel space, runs all of the operating system code in privileged mode, or ring zero on an x86 system, and divides the different functions of the operating system into subsystems of the kernel. All of these subsystems, however, are run in the same memory space. This has the advantage of higher performance, but the disadvantage is that the kernel becomes less modular and more difficult to maintain, and the components are not separated very well. So a crash in one component could in fact bring down the entire system. The opposite of this, the RC4000 style kernel, is what we now call a microkernel. And a microkernel basically contains the bare minimum of code that's necessary in order to implement basic addressing, interprocess communications, and scheduling. This basic amount of code runs in kernel space, and everything else runs in user space, often with lower privileges. As a general rule of thumb, microkernels contain less than 10,000 lines of code. Microkernel-based operating systems tend to be quite modular because they divide the operating system functions between the kernel and a set of servers that run in user space. However, because many of the core functions of the operating system are performed by user space components, which have to communicate with each other via the kernel, performance does suffer. Thus, most kernels that are in use today are a hybrid of these two designs. I'm going to introduce Murphy's Law of Reality, sort of an extension of the Murphy's Laws with which you may be familiar. And my definition of Murphy's Law of Reality is simply that reality is the hazy space between the extremes of competing academic theories in which everything is wrong in some way, at least according to the theories. This idea of a hybrid kernel architecture is a controversial one. Some people do not like to use this terminology at all. Many people prefer to keep the binary classification of monolithic kernel and microkernel. However, if we look at modern kernels, typically the monolithic versions of modern kernels are broken into modules that can be loaded and unloaded at runtime. This helps to increase maintainability of the kernel. And true microkernels today would have unacceptable performance. Thus, microkernel-based systems typically have some of the features of monolithic kernels, such as more device drivers and other code that runs inside the kernel's memory space. Some examples of different types of kernels. For monolithic kernels, in addition to the System 5 Unix kernel, which is a descendant from the original Unix kernel, we have the Linux kernel, BSD, MS-DOS, and Windows 9X kernels. Windows NT, XP, Vista, and 7, if you don't prefer to use the hybrid terminology, would also qualify as monolithic kernels. And the Mac OS X kernel falls into the same category. In terms of microkernels, the RC4000 monitor kernel would have been the earliest. However, there have been plenty of other examples, including Mach, L4, the MIT ExoKernel project, and the idea, at least, behind the Windows NT kernel which was based upon a microkernel design. The same is true of the Mac OS X kernel, since that was originally based on the mock microkernel. However, those have been heavily modified and now have many properties of monolithic kernels also. So in summary, the kernel is the minimum layer of software inside the operating system that provides the basic foundations for abstracting away details of the hardware and arbitrating between multiple applications. When the bare, absolute bare minimum implementations are used, we call the result a microkernel. Monolithic kernels, on the other hand, have all their major OS components contained within them, running everything inside kernel space to improve performance. Two early influential kernels were the RC4000 monitor, an example of a microkernel, and the original Unix kernel, which was an example of a monolithic kernel. In practice, however, most modern operating system kernels are hybrids of the two designs and have features of both kernel types.